Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Ritman Grace Podcast. We hope that it will encourage you as you seek to follow God and grow in your faith. If you would like to know more about our church, you can check us out at www.ritmangrace.org or feel free to email us at ritmangbc at aol.com. But for right now, let's get into today's message. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we ask your Holy Spirit to be present this morning. We'd ask that the forces of darkness that would confuse us, distract us, and create problems in understanding your word would be bound and kept outside. And we'd ask the truth would come forth from your word this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. September 1973. I was 20 years old and a junior at Bowling Green State University. On my way to class. There I'm walking up to Hannah Hall where all kinds of madness happens constantly. And there I saw it. I turned the corner and there were people in robes with signs saying, The end is near! The end is near! Get ready! And I'm like, you know, oh, now what? What, what kind of, you know, because somebody there was always taking crazy pills. So as I got closer, I'm looking at these signs. And there's all this artwork. I'm going, what is this? And then finally somebody said, The Comet Kahootek is coming. It's going to destroy the Earth. December 28, 1973. Well, obviously we're all here. (laughs) Comet Kahootek on December 28th was the biggest astronomical non-event of the 1970s. I went outside to see it. Couldn't see a thing. But it was odd to see people getting all wound up. The end is near. The end is near. I did not believe the end was near because of a comet. But I do believe the rapture is near. And I do believe that after the rapture, there will be cause for people to walk around with signs saying, The end is near. The end is near. Because it will be near because the judgment of God will be at hand. The seven-year tribulation is to follow the rapture. We talked about the rapture several weeks ago when I was here. Well, now I'd like to talk about what happens directly after the rapture. What's going to happen then? What will God's judgment look like? What will the timing be like? What will happen to people who become Christians during the tribulation? What will the end be like? And God assures us in the book of Revelation it would be horrible. And there are some of those questions that we will answer this morning as we're going to look at the first six judgments of God on the earth after the rapture, when the end truly is near. So if you would please turn to Revelation chapter 6. We're going to go through the entire sixth chapter and look at those first six judgments that, are, that come upon the earth. Revelation 6 is after the rapture. And Revelation 6 starts right about the time, well, that's the beginning of the, as soon as this first seal is undone, that's the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. In Revelation chapters 4 and 5, God brings forth, God the Father brings forth the title deed to the earth. It's in a scroll sealed with seven seals. And the the announcement is made by an angel. Who is worthy to take the scroll and open the seals and claim the title deed to earth? And the apostle John, as he writes, he says, I wept because I found no one either above the earth or under the earth or anywhere who can open the scrolls. And then somebody, one of the elders came up to John and says, don't cry. Don't weep. This isn't the place for tears. There is one who can open it. Look. And he shows Jesus Christ, referred to as the Lamb of God, coming forth, who takes the scroll from the hand of the Father. And all of a sudden, heaven rejoices because there's somebody worthy to open up the title deed to the earth and break the seals. And so this morning, we're going to see what happens as Jesus begins to break the seals. So we're going to see what happens here as he opens that first seal and we see the white horse. Please read with me verses 1 through 2. 
I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come! I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. The Lamb of God, the only one, opens the seal, and then one of the four cherubim that attend God says, Come! Another way to understand that word is to say, Proceed! Meaning, okay, it's starting now. And the start of the seven-year tribulation, we see, is actually told, to, we're told when it's going to start, Daniel 9, 27. He says the Antichrist will make a seven-year treaty with Israel. That's when it starts. When that deal is signed, the clock starts ticking. 2,520 days to go until Jesus Christ comes back. And we read about that in Revelation 19. But he says, come. Now, some people think where it says, do you know, I saw the white horse and its rider held a bow and he was given a crown. Some people think that's the force, but I believe that is the Antichrist himself. The Antichrist comes out on a white horse, a conqueror's horse. A white horse. White typically stands for peace. And he is going to be revealed as a man of peace as he comes up. The rapture's just happened. The world is in a state of disarray. And I think between the rapture and that seven-year treaty, there's going to be maybe a week, two weeks, I don't think any more than eight or nine weeks of a gap where the Antichrist will step forward. Nobody knows who it's going to be up until that time. And he will consolidate power in Europe. And he will say, I will bring order and peace. And everybody will say, if you can do it, take it. And when he brings order and peace, the world will follow. What this writer does, he holds a bow. He has a form of power. Notice, no arrows are mentioned. So he has no arrows, and he comes on a white horse of peace and creates a bloodless victory. He makes the seven-year treaty with Israel. Everybody says, this is the guy we need. This is the guy we need to be in charge. This is the one, this is the one that needs to be in charge of the world. And he's given a crown. Not in Greek what's called a diademos, which would be a crown of royalty. But he's given what's called a Stephanos, a prize, a winner's prize. Like Stephanos, that's if you have any friends named Stephanie. The word Stephanos means, her name essentially means she's a prize. So you can go see Stephanie tomorrow at work and say, you know, do you know that you're a prize? And she'll say, oh, yes, I know. But it's a victor's prize that's given to him. This is allowed to him by God. Because when the angel says, come, it's like saying to a dog, come. And the whole time the angels are, these seals are being un, unbroken. The Antichrist is essentially a dog on a leash. And he can only go so far because he's under God's control. So he rides out to conquer the world as a man of peace for three and a half years. Everybody will be going, this guy is great. And the spirit of the Antichrist will fool everybody into thinking, this is what we need, peace and order. You say, oh, how can that happen? Everybody would be able to see this man instantly for what he is. Remember, the Holy Spirit's gone. The believers are gone. It's going to take a while for people to get back into their Bibles and figure things out. See, this just happened in our culture back in the 1930s. Sometimes I'm sad that this book is on my shelf. This is Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler. It outlines exactly how he was going to take over Europe. And it is the most horrible read you could come across because it is convoluted, boring, and rambling. But in here, he begins to say, do you know what, the Treaty of Versailles, that just wasn't right. We need to take the Rhineland back. And all these other lands that were of Germany. Isn't it just fair that we should have back our own homelands? And, you know, sometimes I wonder if our problem isn't the Jewish people. And then he drops it. 
Then farther on in the book, he'll go on and on. And then he'll say something like, you know, do you know, so I really blame the Jews for this. And then he goes farther and farther. It's a book of propaganda. Until in the end, he keeps making more intense, disparaging remarks about the children of Israel. Till in the end, he's saying, this is the fault of the Jews and they should be exterminated for this. And he puts forth his final solution in this book. And do you know what? People believed it. For 10 years, bloodless victory. He broke the Treaty of Versailles. Germany just walked in and took the Rhineland back, just like he said he would. Then they took over Austria, just annexed them. Then they annexed Czechoslovakia and a few other countries that they called the Sudetenland, the southern lands. And he was called a man of peace, bloodless victory. Britain and France were totally taken in by this. They thought he was a man of peace. Neville Chamberlain comes back from a meeting with Hitler in 1938. See, we have peace. He says he's not going to attack anybody. And then September 1939, he marches into Poland with panzer tanks and in three days devastates Poland and World War II breaks out. This is how it will be with the Antichrist. He will look like a man of peace, but at the three and a half year mark, he will reveal what he truly is on the inside. Now, I think this first seal is probably going to last two, two and a half years into the tribulation. And everybody's going to say, what a great guy. And then it's going to come time when the second seal is broken and we see the red horse come forth. Revelation 6, 3 through 4. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. The lamb opens the seal again. The angel says, proceed. And an angelic authority, an angelic power, rides forth on a red horse. Red meaning war. Red for the spilling of blood. And what this rider does, he breaks the false peace on the earth. This is part of God's wrath on the earth and part of God's way to say, I am going to now expose who the Antichrist is. I'm going to show this man is not just a man of peace. And this is year between years two and three of the tribulation. And it says that this rider makes men slay each other. And it's, he's given a great sword, so he's given the power to make war. Anger and malice multiply. Boy, and don't you see that in TVs and movies and video games? The executions that are shown, everything is so violent and so bloody. The spirit of the Antichrist. And there's angry people everywhere. Two weeks ago, I'm in the valley, and I'm on my way to Lucky Shoes. I'm in a pretty good mood because I'm going to buy a new pair of Sunday school teaching shoes. These black shoes are my preaching shoes. I only wear them when I speak in public. That's, they're 20 years old and look brand new. But my Sunday school teaching shoes, which are also black and more comfortable, you know, those wear out pretty quickly because I tend to wear them all over. So I'm pretty happy. I'm getting a new pair of shoes. And I am at the, and I see people just screaming at each other, shaking their fists, because I've got my windows down. The older I get, the less I listen to the radio. And I'm going, why is everybody so angry? I wanted to say, go get a new pair of shoes. It'll make you feel better. But I can see this. Don't you see it in the culture? People are mad. They're not forgiving. I watched a guy yesterday. I took Joseph to school, and as I was pulling out, I saw a guy right next to me. I said, oh, no, older guy. There's a guy coming. He's going to pull out right in front of him. Pulled out right in front of this guy in a Jeep. The Jeep had plenty of time to stop. The old guy didn't even see what he did, but the guy in the Jeep just sat there, just rawr, rawr, rawr. And I'm like, it's an older dude. Cut him a little slack. I'm an older dude. Cut me a little slack. <laughs> but the Antichrist will have to go to war with this, with this power, this angelic power that's given a great sword. I think that means modern weaponry, and we're going to see worldwide war at this point. Now, at this point, all the believers are in heaven. We've been raptured. This is a view of what's going on for everybody who's 
who rejected Christ or who were in church but never really made a decision to trust in him and were left behind. So this is what's going to happen while the church is in heaven, the believers are in heaven, and a lot of people that we love and care for are back here on earth. And the Antichrist is going to have to go to war, and Daniel 8.24 tells us that the Antichrist will excel at war. And if you want, you can read about his exploits in Daniel 11.36-45. through 45. It'll talk about the king of the south, which will be the Arab nations, the king of the north, which will be Russia, the king of the east will be China, and the Antichrist himself will lead the Western Confederation. So there's the king of the West. A lot of people say, where's the United States? I don't think we count. Because all the prophecy has to do with the revived Roman Empire. So the king of the West will be the Antichrist. Now that takes us through the second seal. Now let's see what happens when the lamb breaks the third seal, revealing the black horse. In six five through six. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come! I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Again, the angel, Proceed! You come forth on our command. And again, an angelic authority on a black horse. Black horse. Black for death. Now, this doesn't happen much anymore up at Gilman's funeral home. But I remember as a kid when Gilman's was just down here on Main Street, no more than 200 yards away from the church. And as a kid, I went in there. When you went to Gilman's, you wore black. Black was the color of there's been death in someone's house and we're wearing black for mourning. That's how the culture was. So it's not that far in our collective memory to remember when everybody wore black as a sign of mourning. Black for death. Black for mourning. And this black horse brings death because once there's war, which is brought on by the red horse, what happens to food production? What happens to farming? It's all disrupted. Entire harvest seasons are lost. And food becomes short. That's why he's carrying a pair of scales, saying, we've got to ration food to everybody now. And guess what? You can get a quart of wheat, enough to make a loaf of bread, just enough to sustain you for an entire day's wages. So let's say a person has a real nice job someplace. They're making $30 an hour. They work eight hours. They make $240 a day. A loaf of bread is $240. Or you can get for barley, which is more like animal feed. And you can get more, but there's not the same nutritional value. War is going to disrupt production. It will be famine and part of God's wrath. And the response, I think, of famine is going to be, he's a lot of wants to feed and only so much food. And when you can't multiply food and you've got too big of a demand, well, what's the answer to the problem? I can't make more food. I'll just have to reduce the demand. So how can we reduce the demand? Maybe this is, in a way to look innocent, accidentally on purpose, COVID-20 is released. COVID-21. That lab in Wuhan, engineering this virus for 10 years, there had to be a COVID-1, or five and on to get to COVID-19, you know they have COVID-2021 already in the works. And if it's just released accidentally on purpose, 
Well, that would be a way to feed more people by getting... Problems with this? Sometimes I hear it going in and out. Let me... Yes? It's a pale horse. Its rider was named Death and Hades, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the water. Kind of a greenish haze. Clorox, how it has that slight. And everything I've read says that that's the color. Colors. So it's going to be. Oh, we have it. David is helping me with a technical difficulty. Do you think so? That may be it. So this is an angelic authority, and God's wrath is shown sometimes by the angel of death. Remember when that happened in Exodus 12, 23, when all of the firstborn of Egypt were killed? where the angel of death, the destroyer, was sent by God to kill the firstborn child of every household that did not have the blood on the lintels. So this isn't a, a foreign idea, and it wouldn't be the first time that this angel of death had been employed by God. Now what does that writer do? He and Hades, both angelic authorities, it says they are given the power to kill a fourth on the earth by the sword. One quarter of the world population. Right now we're at about 8 billion people. 25%. Just to get an idea of how many people that is, there are 600 million people in North America. That means everybody in Canada. South America has 400 million. Everybody in South America, dead. No humans in South America. Europe has 750 million. Everybody in Europe, really dead. Have, you have one, two, point eight billion. You've got another 20 million to go. It's going to take place. And this is God's wrath on to Jesus Christ. And offering mercy, saying, if saved. This time. With two billion people, you can imagine how deliberate the Antichrist are as they're saying, more people to enjoy our eternity in the lake of and they will be joyous.
Peter's methods, they're going to be the same four methods that God has used throughout all history in order to show his wrath on the earth. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by the sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. These are the same four tools of God's wrath mentioned in Ezekiel 14.21 as God's wrath coming on Jerusalem and on Judah from Babylon. We now revealing the saint calling for avenging Let's read through verses 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been killed, was completed. Many souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God. And you see, many souls, and they called out in a loud voice. As they talked, you can understand what they're saying. They actually talk in sentences. These are people who are dead, who have gone to heaven, and they are addressing Jesus in heaven Verbally, they can encode messages. Do you know what that says to me, what happens when I die? I still go on. When I die as a believer, I go to heaven. I am recognizable. I can communicate. And I understand what's going on, both in heaven and on the earth. Do you have loved ones who've gone on? that you think about from time to time, you know they were believers, they're in heaven. They understand what's going on here. They understand what's, they can talk to Jesus. They can express themselves. The idea that when we die, it's just destruction and that's, it's all over. No. Untrue, according to the Bible. At the same time, what happens to those It's eternal destruction, separation from God. It's torment in the lake of fire. And they will they will call out for help that will never come in individual voices. They will wail and cry and gnash their teeth throughout all, throughout all eternity. And there will be hope because the time to make the decision for Christ is now so they are individuals and I love thinking about that I love thinking that you know my grandmothers are up there my grandparents my dad is up there aware of what's going on down here and he has a voice and I will meet him either when I'm raptured or at when I die. But these are tribulation martyrs. These are people who had never made a decision for Christ. For one reason or another, the rapture happens and they are left behind. And finally they say, I better start reading this. And they get saved after the rapture. And they're persecuted. They believe them. They figured out who the Antichrist is, and they're probably sitting there going, ha, 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 we know who you are. We know what's going on. We can tell you from the book of Revelation exactly what's going to happen. And because they testify Jesus Christ, of the Bible because they exposed the identity of the Antichrist. He didn't want people to turn on him. He killed him. 
and they became martyrs. And it said that the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained, he said, I saw under the altar. The altar is where sacrifices are made, and this is where these people were stored. This is where they were living until their resurrection bodies came to be. The altar is a special place in the Old Testament. That's where the sacrifices for sin were made. Something that was sacrificed and offered to God as a its blood was poured out at the altar. It would be a little long to go through all these verses, but if you go to Leviticus, it talks about five different kinds of sacrifices that are made to the Lord. In Leviticus 4, 3 through 7, it talks about how the blood of the sacrifice is to be poured out at the altar. In Leviticus 4, 16, another type of sacrifice. You pour the blood out at the base of the altar. Pour the blood out at the altar. 434, you pour the blood out at the base of the altar. The tribulation saints poured their blood out, their very lives, at the base of the altar. And here is an altar in heaven. Revelation 11.19 Altar, the true altar, is in heaven. Moses was just told to make a copy of the brazen altar to use on earth. The true Ark of the Covenant is in heaven. The Jews on the Sinai Peninsula, they made a copy of it Mount Sinai. Temple of God, the Holy of Holies in the temple and in the tabernacle, was a perfect cube. The kind of glory of God lived. Do you know when the New Jerusalem from heaven comes down upon the earth in Revelation 21, 15 to 16, it talks about how it's going to be 1,380 miles long, 1,380 miles wide, 1,380 miles high, and this will be God's dwelling with men throughout all eternity. Length, height, and width, all 1,380 miles, designates a perfect cube. All these things we see in the Old Testament are, are patterns of what's actually up in heaven. 1,380 miles, that's like driving from Rittman to the eastern edge of the Rocky Mountains. That's how long it is. And then think this city of God is going to be that high above the earth. It's going to be massive. Now I think this event happens just, just before mid-trib, just before the three and a half year seal. And the call for God's vengeance comes then. And these... people who murdered them and their families. And when they call out, Oh, Sovereign Lord! Oh, or, oh the, the Greek word typically referred to in the New Testament by, to Jesus is kurios, Lord. Now they're saying despotes, Sovereign Lord, despotic ruler. You who, when you say anything, it happens immediately. There's no questioning your authority. Oh, fuller. God is love and patience and forgiveness, wanting all to come to a knowledge of salvation, but God is also vengeance and wrath towards those who reject him. Psalm 79.10 says, You avenge the outpoured blood of your servants. Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers, who were to be killed as they had been, was completed. 
So there were more martyrs to come. God knew there were more people yet that were going to die. So the prayer that there is. I love it when I get a yes. And although I'm not happy about it when I pray and I get a no, but at least if I get a no, it's set in stone. Answer to prayer is this, wait a little longer. No, not answering that right now. Wait a little longer. Oh, how much longer? Wait a little longer. And they're given a white robe. This is what they're given because they, they, they shed their blood. And they said, just wait a little while longer. Opens the sixth seal. And I'm possibly at the four-year mark, four-and-a-half-year mark of the tribulation. And the earth is rocked, verses 12 to 17. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to earth as, as, a late, as late fig trees drop from a, as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? There's a great shaking. That's what it's saying here in the original text. A mammoth earthquake from their place and they're just floating magma layer that are all positioned on right now. Everything is broken apart. We'll say, well, how, how dark could it get? Well, just 10 years ago in Iceland when Mount Eya Forgot Your Yogurt went off. And I always remember that by... All the airports in Europe were shut down. The ash cloud. It was, it was dead as far as air travel. The moon will be blood red. Again, volcanic ash. It talks about stars falling from the sky. Now, this isn't stars like Betelgeuse and Antares and Andromeda. But it's, it's like an asteroid shower. Even now, that's common talk if we see a, sh you know, you know, we'll say, oh, look, a falling star. You know, so that's just how we, it doesn't mean, you know, a, a sun is going to fall upon the earth. But these are, go these are going to be, do you remember just back in 2013, the Chelyabinsk meteorite that came down? It looked like a nuclear missile over Russia that exploded. 1,200 people were injured, mostly because the thing gave a great flash of light. It was so far away. And then people went, went to their windows to see what the flash of light was. And then the shock wave came 30 seconds later and blasted all the windows into people's faces and glass shards. That's how most people were injured. And that was, that was actually as big as this church building. It came to the atmosphere, and then it went. Thirty nineteen oh eight. Now, typical events like that, once every hundred years. Well, now these are going to be like one event like this every one or ten minutes. And it's going to say the stars were shooting stars like this. Asteroids were going to be falling from the sky, hitting the earth as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. Just pop, 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 pop. This will be terrifying. And then 
Verse 14, the sky receded like a scroll, rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. But the sky receded like a scroll, rolling up. Now that's what it's going to look like. And I tried hard to figure out what this means. And the best I can come up with here, because really, that's a tough verse. That's a tough section of the verse to interpret. I know that in Revelation 12, there's going to be war in heaven, and Michael the archangel will throw Satan and the demons out of the second heaven where they live. I'm wondering if this means when it says the sky receded like a scroll, this is going to be God going up to the realm of Satan and kicking in his front door. Now imagine what it would be like if you're sitting at your house one night, you're having dinner with your family, everything is nice, and then someone kicks in your front door. It'd be pretty terrifying. That's, that's how I interpret this. When you're sitting like a scroll, something's happening in that realm where Satan and the demons operate, that they'll be thrown out of in Revelation 12, where their front door's kicked in, and God's saying, I'm, I'm coming for you. Your time is limited, buddy. And no one's going to escape this because it's the whole world that's going to be shaken. And there's going to be a panicked response. Every strata of society is going to flee. Kings of the earth, the princes, generals, the rich, the mighty, every slave, every free man, hiding in holes in the ground. And then what really amazes me, they're saying, fall on us. Destroy us. And hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. They know who's coming. They're, they're actually sitting there going, we know this is from God, and we know this is Jesus Christ giving these judgments upon the earth. And even though we know it's from them, and they say in their word, all we've got to do is turn. We'd rather crawl into a hole in the ground and have the rocks fall on us and crush us, rather than turn and give glory to you and admit that we're wrong. That... I can't wrap my head around it. But it comes to a point a person can say no to God so many times that they get so far that even God can't reach them. They can't repent. Fall on us. For the great day of God's wrath has come. When we think of Jesus, and we've got a picture just like this at our church where I attend. And we think this. Oh, gentle. He's, he's all love and acceptance and, and patience. And I've got time. Yeah, and I know I'm struggling with this sin, but, you know, he's going to be patient with me. And so we look at, you know, Jesus being there. Yeah, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. I'm patiently knocking. But a day is coming. And I think this has a lot to do with the book of Revelation. It reveals Jesus Christ as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Vengeful those his servants. Those who have disobeyed. Trust isn't enough. We, we don't want it. No part of it. There's a church I went to for a wedding two years ago, and they had a huge mural in front of their church of the risen, glorified Jesus. Not what you see in a church, Jesus teaching, giving the Beatitudes on the cross. No, this was a powerful, impressive image of Jesus Christ in heaven, glorified. And it was stunning. I really watched the stained glass image more than I watched. I was sitting there going, this is what it's going to be like. I'm actually kind of scared as I look at that. 
And when we think of Jesus and seeing Him, a lot of us say, oh, it's going to be so much fun. You know, here He is. You know, He's going to be like this. We'll go up and, you know, we'll... At the same time, it's, it's the God of the universe. And when John, the disciple who Jesus loved, in, in chapter 1, sees him in his glorified form, John falls to man, paralyzed with fear. We need to see both sides of who Jesus Christ is. The Lamb of God and the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Forgiveness and yet vengeful and wrathful. And we study the end times and we look at the book. It gives us hope. But it also motivates us. It motivates us to good life. And it says, so then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. That's why we look at things like the rapture. That's why we look at what's going to happen in the tribulation. And in a way, when we see what Jesus is going to do, what he will unleash on the earth, part of us should be going, justice. But another part of us should be going, this scares me. And it should also make us think, as far as what's going on in our own personal lives, you know what? Maybe I need to bring a couple things under control because there's me. And, and I don't want to sit before the Bema seat of Christ and have something happen where he says, I have this against you. So these words give us hope, but most of all, this should motivate us to a godly life. God is in control. The Antichrist can only go so far. Our God is still a God of love and forgiveness, and in wrath there is still mercy. But for some, even in the midst of wrath, they know where it's coming from, who it's coming from, and they still will not repent. But for us, we should look at these events and say, I want to live a better life for Christ. Let's close in prayer. Father, a lot of things about the end are frightening. But in a lot of ways, I, I want it to come. I want things to be set right and for justice to take place on the earth. I want goodness. I want to see mercy and not anger and death and destruction. I want to see Jesus Christ in control. But if the rapture happens and I'm taken up, who's going to It's going to be a while till they figure things out. So, Father, right now, I need to take it upon myself to be a lot more serious about my witness, my testimony, the quality of my life. Father, I'd ask that's a challenge we could all walk away with and say, I need to live a better life in Christ in view of what's coming. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Ritman Grace Podcast. If you have questions or would like to know more about our church, please visit www.ritmangrace.org or email us at ritmangbc at aol.com.